Welcome back to Velshi and Rule. My next guest is front and center in the immigration crisis. Ken Cuccinelli is President Trump's acting director of citizenship and immigration services. He has held that role since June 10th, a little under a month, but arguably a very busy month. In that time, we have gathered new reporting on the severely backed up immigration pipeline, overcrowded migrant detention centers, reports of children held in cramped, filthy, dangerously unhygienic spaces, public debates on asylum policy, more migrant deaths, and a renewed promise from President Trump to round up undocumented immigrants sometime after July 4th. Joining me now to talk about some of that is Acting Director of Citizenship and Immigration uh, Services, Ken Cuccinelli, formerly the Attorney General of Virginia. Sir, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Let's talk. Uh, let's get right into it. You were at a naturalization ceremony this morning. I was. Uh, and uh, At the 9-11 Memorial, and you highlighted how, in your words, so many people around the world make sacrifices each day in order to call the United States their new home. And, and arguably, that's what a lot of people are doing at the southern border. So I, I guess we're, one of the problems we've got down there is this migrant protection protocol. Some people call it the remain in Mexico policy. What, what was your role in designing that policy? So, well, in designing it, I came in as it was well underway. And in fact, elements of it are logistical elements of it are still being fleshed out as it expands across the border. Uh, right now it's being implemented in three locations and that's expanding as we go through the summer. And as capacity allows and critically as Mexico allows. Mm -hmm. They are an equal partner in this um, and uh, the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security has been engaged in those discussions with Mexico. He was down there recently in Guatemala for instance in El Salvador. He's been down in the Northern Triangle quite a bit and the Department of State. We're used to seeing the Department of State do these things, but because of the immigration element, uh, Department of Homeland Security has been involved. And so that's expanding slowly. Uh, it does not involve Mexicans. That's kind right. of a key element. Right. Right. It's people coming from south of Mexico who are first filtered to qualify and uh, held in Mexico pending asylum applications, for instance, whether they be Cuban, Guatemalan, uh, El Salvadoran, yep. et cetera, and the list goes on. So that's the, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. That's the process. I was down in El Paso last week. Um, it's hard to judge on a short time period but it appears that the implementation of MPP is easing at least some of the problem in some parts of the border. It's still a bit of a flood down there. Yeah. And uh, as you, I think you used the right word in your introduction, the pipeline. Yeah. It gets clogged in particular yeah. places. And it, if the whole thing doesn't work, the whole pipeline. So let's go to the front of the pipeline to figure out that problem. You, you just mentioned Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Refer yes. to those as the Northern Triangle countries. That's where most of the people are coming from. I want to just put up, because I, I think about it economically a lot, the, the per capita GDP in those countries, uh, $4,500 in Guatemala, $2,400 in Honduras, $44,000 in El Salvador, versus the United States, which has a per capita GDP of 62641 Now, that's not a direct correlation to income, but I think everybody gets the right. point. That, that they're nowhere clear, close to the kind of life you can have in America. So some of them might be political refugees, some of them might be fearful for their lives, but many of them, I think we probably agree, are what you would call economic refugees. Overwhelmingly, yes. How do we think about that? How do you think about that? Well, first of all, uh, the, the ceremony I got to, uh, first time I've ever administered the oath to new citizens, I've participated in naturalization before, but first time to administer the oath, those folks came through many of them for economic reasons, mm -hmm. but they followed the rules, they obeyed the law. And on the southern border, what we see is we see an attempt, successfully in some respects, to swamp our asylum system in particular. And asylum is run mm -hmm. by my agency, USCIS. And that is designed historically for political refugees, religious refugees, those being persecuted in their home country who have nowhere else to go, those sorts of things. And yet, what we see both in MPP and more generally is our, our economic ref people right. migrating for economic so, reasons. So in a, in a perfect world, would you want more people or, or the bulk of those people applying through the immigration process oh, absolutely. Than, to, than the asylum process? Because the problem is you're a member of an administration that actually thinks we should lower legal immigration, let alone worrying about illegal immigration. Well, the proposal that the president and the White House has started to talk about is to hold that number where it is, not to lower it. And some of the president's allies on immigration are upset with that starting point. So I don't think your characterization is correct in terms of the legislation they've put forward. And I would note, last year we naturalized under this president 
percent more new u.s citizens than in five years and this year we will do more than that so uh while uh, there's two different stories going on the legal one and those numbers continue to grow and the illegal one and unfortunately those numbers continue to grow at the same time so you deal with them both separately obviously and uh, we're struggling mightily at the border with the illegal so side. we've got I, i'm looking at the numbers of asylum grants by nationality and the bottom line is uh of the people who make grants from El Salvador, from uh, so most asylum grants, by the way, most Americans may not know this come from China, uh, yes. but but from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, which are the the next three, most of them are rejected. That's the acceptance rate. Uh, the asylum claims are on the left. This is for 2017. The grants, the people who are granted asylum, is on the right, and then the acceptance rate. So more than 90 percent of people who come from those three countries in 2017 were not granted asylum in the Correct. first place. So one would argue the system's not broken. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're not getting well, their asylum what's, credit. They're what's broken is because the pipeline is clogged at various points that weren't designed to handle this sort of a flow, uh, there has been some catch and release. There have been other programs. Now, we started talking about MPP, which is actually a control flow. Right. They, they wait for their hearing. They come in for their hearing. They have their hearing. And the statistics you put up uh, tend to, when you work through that process are where we tend to end up. Um, however, uh, the legal process is one where we expect them to apply often in their home country, mm -hmm. or perhaps they come on an employment visa and they apply for adjustment of status. But all of those are legal paths. And many of those legal paths mm -hmm. find their way to legal permanent residency, which is more commonly referred to as green card. And after five years, those people can apply for naturalization. And we have rising numbers of applicants being granted by this under this administration. So I want to I want to talk to you about asylum a little bit. The, sure. the, in, in the United States um, ratified the 1967 protocol, the Inter United Nations protocol relating to the status of refugees, which was based on a 1951 document. Yes, as an uh, update. And yeah. in it in it, it says um, by ratifying the 1967 protocol, this isn't a lawsuit, by the way, uh, against the um, Remain in Mexico policy, the MP that the asylum officers have, have uh, filed. In the, by ratifying the 1967 protocol, the United States agreed not to, among other things, penalize refugees for their illegal entry or stay in the country or expel uh, or return, which is called refowler, a refugee in any manner whatsoever to the frontiers of territories where his life or freedom would be threatened. So you're a lawyer, you're an attorney general. What part of that do you disagree with? Uh, well, as you read it by itself, none. And what you get to there are what are more commonly discussed today are credible fear interviews and various levels right. of fear interviews, including in the MPP program where it is there, it's fear of going back to Mexico. Now, mind you, it's for people who came up through Mexico. Right. Um, and we get about 6% of the MPP uh, participants uh, who come to us with fear claims and about one-sixth of those are found to be uh, appropriate right. for not going back to Mexico. So they stay in the United States pending the outcome of But do you support that, that view? Do you, do, because your officers are saying that you're asking them to do something. You, you um, allegedly sent an email to asylum officers explaining the process for asylum claims, telling them to faithfully apply the law, as would be expected, right. uh, directing them to make only possible, positive, credible fear determinations in cases that have a significant possibility of success in the courts. So that sort of sounds like you're asking people on the front line to predetermine what a legal process will will achieve. Well, the there are two. Did you, standards. you did send that email? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, there are two standards uh, that 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 are impl that are utilized mm -hmm. in this process, the credible fear process. The first one is the significant possibility standard. It's a very low standard. Um, that's why you see 77 numbers percent so, yeah. coming through and yet when they go before immigration judges only about 15 percent less than one-fifth are actually found to meet the credible fear standard so we have uh, two legal standards with dramatically different outcomes and the first is not serving frankly as an effective filter for the second it's something we've talked to congress about significantly and um, it's part of why the pipeline gets clogged because those people are kept out of what had been the traditional process utilized 
really by the border patrol because others didn't have to be involved in it right at the border. So I've got the, the law here. Um, it's, it's U.S. Code 1158. It's on asylum. So basically, in your perfect world, uh, again, as a, as a former attorney general, your officers would be familiar with this law. They'd read it and they'd, and they'd use this as the basis for well, determining. I would note that's pretty thin for the law. I mean, the law. I, I agree. This is, to contend with this, is very, <laughs> this is very specifically U.S. Code 1158. This is the Understood. section on asylum. The asylum this is the section. reprint from uh, Cornell because the actual government document, which I've got here, is, as you know, government documents are very hard to read. They're very small. But I've got that here as well. I guess my question is. Is this, as I read it, and we've read the, the, the parts on credibility determination, right. uh, this indicates that it's for a judge to determine. The, the reference in this law is a trier of fact may base a credibility determination on the dot, 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 a trier of fact. Right. Are your officers on the front line triers of fact? Because this law suggests that you're entitled to a hearing if you make a claim of asylum at a, at a U.S. port of entry. Well, there are, well, first of all, the, Things at the port of entry have been different than beyond the port. Uh, agreed. Uh, that's a, a right. And, and as, uh, put that aside. But uh, there are immigration judges in the Department of Justice. In e EOR is what we refer to it. EOIR. Um, they're not in the Department of Homeland Security. So when you see the 77 percent initial credible fear finding, that's with that significant possibility standard. That is a finding made by people in my agency. Mm -hmm. Then they move on in the process. So in other words, that person makes the claim, and then they get to do what? Stay in the United States or go back to Mexico while it's adjudicated? If credible fear is found at, with that standard, uh, setting MPP aside, mm -hmm. they are not returned to the They are part of the country. process now. They are part of the process. This is the asylum, asylum process. Asylum process, correct. This is not an uh, immigration, immigration yes. process other yeah. than asylum. And as you noted earlier, uh, it, the, the reason China is number one in this is because they are a tyrannical communist regime mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is credibly uh, findable to be mm -hmm. persecuting people. So uh, that's and a good that, point. That's a lot harder to find in Honduras. So let's go back to the GDP so per capita. I want to ask my right. controller to put that up. Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. This is a tricky conversation because at, at $2,500 a year GDP, that would, argue, that would mean most people are making very little money, arguably $10 a day day of picking something in, in Honduras. So th these people may have credible fears about their life, about the fact that they're going to be involved with gangs or gangs are going to extort them or sexual assault or whatever the case is. Does, th th that's sort of somewhere between economic and something else. Well, right? the, the economic elements aren't a consideration for credible fear. Right. And, and in but is fact, that a credible fear? Is a woman's fear of a uh, gang sexually assaulting her? or? Well, of course, the statistics of people coming up through Mexico are that something like 30 percent of them are being assaulted in that in that journey. Right. But, uh, so but nobody's pretty. That's but nobody's pretty picking severe. nobody's picking that journey to be sexually assaulted. Right. They're escaping something. That isn't the goal. Of yeah. course not. And uh, we have now even more as time goes on developed maps from inside each of these countries about where it is safe and degrees of safety. Uh, so where they're from and where they could live. Mm -hmm. um, gangs are, of course, a concern. MS-13, mm -hmm. which when I was a state attorney general in Virginia... It's a very serious concern. Was, well, it was the most violent gang yeah. active in Virginia. And, uh, and, of course, they reach internationally. So that is a concern and that is a factor considered incredible fear. So do you, have a, do you have a view on how, as, a, as somebody who be, who's responsible for executing these laws and advising the president, do you have a view on how we solve that problem? Because ultimately people are going to want to go from a country where the GDP per capita is less than one-tenth it is in the United States on our hemisphere, uh, ostensibly within walking distance. Like that's going to continue to be a problem. How do we solve that? Well, for, for starters, there's been an awful lot of um, uh, aid sent in that direction. I would note that uh, one of the presidents down there said, hey, you know, we own part of this problem. We need to fix at where we live. And the reality is, if you take it on a pure economic basis, there are 80 times as many people in the world, as the last statistic I saw, that are coming north yep. um, 
at that relative economic position around the world. We cannot absorb that as no, a country. No, but, but, but there's something needs to be done, right? Because Donald Trump has threatened to cut off aid to those countries. Yes, he has. Which is arguably, again, from my economic, not political perspective, would only seem to make their situation worse, which would make them want to come to America more. Well, he used a similar tactic with Mexico on the tariffs, and it brought Mexico to the table. They've been more productive than they've ever been before in these discussions. Different story, though. Mexico's GDP per capita uh, is much higher. I understand that, but, but it's tough tactics either way. In this case, instead of imposing a tariff, it's taking away financial aid that's given freely with no, no strings attached, really. I, I don't literally mean no strings attached, but we're not paying for things from these right. countries. We're giving them money to try to rehabilitate their government and their economy, and they're struggling to do it. Um, and the reality is going forward that as, until they can uh, and as they can develop yep. safety yep. and their own economies, that's how that problem Th that gets That seems solved. like a, a, a reasonable solution. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.